us. I'm Cora, the uh, Director of Multimedia and Manatee Research Associate for Save the Manatee Club. And I'll just do a brief introduction and then hand it over to Tiare, our Manatee Biologist, for the actual presentation. So um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, we are going to take questions after the webinar, so um, you can put them into the Q&A function, which you should be seeing at the top of your screen. So that's easier than putting them in the chat. Um, it's easier for us to monitor that way, and then we'll be taking those questions at the very end of the presentation. Um, also, just maybe as a little bit of an icebreaker, if everyone wants to let us know where they're from, you can type that in the chat um, just to give us an idea um, who you are, where you're tuning in from. Always fun to see. And then we'll get started with the actual presentation in just about a minute. I'm still admitting some people that are coming in, so I'll be doing that. Very cool. I see we have people from all over the place. Wow, United Kingdom, Florida, Chicago, Ohio, Las Vegas. I can't read that fast, but lots <laughs> of people, not just from Florida, also lots of people from um, around the United States, as well as um, as well as around the globe, I guess. All right, well, I'll hand it over to Tiare. Um, again, everyone, welcome to the presentation. For um, any questions, you can please type them into the Q&A, and we'll be taking those at the very end of the presentation. OK, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to share the presentation now, so just give me a second. All right, Cora, how does that look? It looks great. I can see your screen, so yeah, perfect. All right, yes. Now, everybody, please put any questions you have in the Q&A section, and we will touch on them at the end of the presentation, OK? So this presentation is Manatees and Seagrass, Seagrass 101, and we'll be talking about the basics of seagrass biology, the importance of seagrass to other creatures in Florida, where seagrass grows in Florida, why Florida is losing seagrass, what is being done to protect and restore this seagrass, and what we can do to help. So what is seagrass? Seagrass is actually a group of flowering plants that grow in the marine environment. There's, over, there's around 60 species of fully marine, meaning that they live in saltwater, grasses worldwide, and we have 26 species in North America. They evolved from terrestrial land plants around 140 million years ago. And they're called grasses because many species, species have long, narrow leaves like the grasses on our lawns. They photosynthesize for food and energy like other plants. And there's actually, seagrass is those grasses that live in marine environments. But in Florida, we have a type of grass that lives in freshwater and is often found around springs, which is called eelgrass. And I just wanted to distinguish that those two are different, but the term for them is often used interchangeably. So how do seagrasses grow? Seagrasses are actually connected underneath the sediment. So they grow in soft bottoms like sand, and there's one thick stem that actually connects a lot of different uh, plants together. So you can see here in this diagram, you have different plants coming off of a sheath and the roots go underneath the ground and the leaf blades go up. Um, the plants actually aren't strong enough to support themselves like land plants are, and they're supported by the buoyancy of the water. So here's an actual photo of a seagrass plant. You can see the rhizome, which is, as I said, the thick stem that goes underneath, and see how all of these plants are connected. So seagrasses grow both vertically, so going up, and horizontally, with the roots growing down and sideways. And they can spread by two methods. They will do asexual cloning. So the way that they grow with a rhizome underneath the sediment is actually asexual because in a big group of seagrass, one giant group can all be one plant and all be genetically the same. And they also have sexual reproduction. They have flowers and actually release pollen. So in this first picture here, you can see this fuzzy stuff here is pollen. And on the photo on the right, you can see this uh, crustacean here, and they actually visit different flowers, and it's suspected that they spread 
the pollen from flower to flower, much like bees do. And there are male and female flowers. And when they release pollen, the pollen will move in the water and land from one, one flower to another. So how do seagrasses grow? They use photosynthesis, as I said. And what does this mean? So photosynthesis is when a plant will take in carbon dioxide and water and use it to create energy with the sun. So seagrass, because they're in the water, they already have access to that water and they pull in the CO2 from the water column. So CO2 is actually able to dissolve in water. So that's how they take it in and they actually release oxygen after they make this energy. And they use these special cells called chloroplasts, which you can see in this picture here. They actually hold on to the pigments that are needed to make food and energy. So when seagrass grows in large areas, it creates a habitat called a seagrass meadow. And those are considered prairies of the sea because they actually provide a lot of habitat for many different animals. It's one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, and they are an important food source and habitat for many, many species. Who uses seagrass meadows? Worldwide, they provide a home for more than 1,000 species of fish, including commercially important species that we have here, like snapper and grunts. It's also common to see sharks foraging, like this nurse shark here on the right. They also act as a nursery habitat, and a nursery habitat is a habitat that prov provides protection for the younger juveniles in a species. So the smaller ones that would be very easily picked off by bigger creatures can hide inside these grasses. In Florida, the nurseries are for snapper, red drum, spiny lobsters, and snow cra uh, stone crabs. And these species actually can move between the different ecosystems. So we have mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs here in Florida, and they're all connected. The young of the species will move between these different habitats, so they're actually all interconnected. So seagrass meadows are, are, are also a primary food source for some species like sea urchins, parrotfish, sea turtles, and manatees. And I'm sure some of you are already aware that sea turtles and manatees love seagrass. So seagrass and manatees. Why is seagrass important for manatees? Well, manatees eat over 60 species of aquatic plants. They're generalist herbivores. They aren't really picky, but seagrass makes up the bulk of their diet. Manatees eat one-tenth of their body weight in plants every day. So a 1,000-pound manatee will eat 100 pounds of plants in a day. Manatees eat all seven species that we have in Florida. And seagrass is considered critically important habitat for manatees. So where do seagrasses grow? They grow completely underwater. So they're, they don't grow in areas where the water actually pulls back. Um, and they need a lot of light for photosynthesis. As I said, they need pho to do photosynthesis in order to create food and energy. So they need to be in areas where the water is clear and shallow enough for them to get the light they need. And also with soft bottoms. They're not gonna grow on a rocky bottom or something like that. They need protection from wave action, so they're typically found in calmer waters like bays. And they need the right amount of nutrients. They need nitrogen and phosphorus to grow, but not too much because that can cause algae to grow. So this is a map of where seagrass is found in Florida. It's actually from the Florida-Alabama line. They actually have seagrass all the way past Florida, and it wraps all the way around down to the Keys and goes up to Volusia County on the East Coast. It is estimated that there's more than 2 million acres of seagrass found along Florida's coastlines. Um, and as I said before, we have seven species here in Florida. So these are the seven different species that we have. Turtle grass, shoal grass, manatee grass, widgeon grass or rupia, stargrass, paddle grass, and Johnson seagrass. And they all have slightly different shape and the way that they grow. Um, so you can see here that they all do look slightly different. So why is seagrass important? Seagrass meadows provide food and shelter for thousands of species. They actually reduce erosion because their roots hold down the sediment, especially in these huge areas with seagrass meadows. They protect us against coastal storm surge, the leaves actually reduce the wave action from storms. They enhance water quality because they absorb bacteria and nutrients that can cause algae to grow. And they slow the speed of climate change by absorbing the CO2 during photosynthesis. And that's actually called a carbon sink. A carbon sink is when a habitat 
uh, absorbs more carbon than it releases. And seagrass is known to be one of the most important carbon sinks around the globe. So the world's oceans actually absorb carbon dioxide all the time. They're doing that either by organisms photosynthesizing and absorbing it, or the CO2 in the air absorbing directly into the water, uh, because CO2, as I said, is dissolvable in water. And when seagrass photosynthesizes, it absorbs the carbon from the water, and then that pulls more of it into the ocean. So seagrass actually stores this carbon after photosynthesizing in its tissues and in the sediment, and that's why we call it a carbon sink. This reduces the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which slows the heating and climate change. So what would happen if we were to lose seagrass? So for one, we'd lose important nursery habitat, fish habitat, and food sources for a lot of animals. We'd also lose, we'd also lose um, food sources for a lot of endangered species, um, like certain sea turtles. The water quality would decrease, not only because seagrass dying creates a lot of dead matter in the water, but also because the seagrass absorbs nutrients. We'd have less protection from storms naturally, which would actually make erosion and other problems worse. And this carbon that's stored in seagrasses would be released, which would increase climate change, the, the um, speed of climate change and make oceans more acidic because CO2 being released into the oceans actually increases the pH. So we've actually been experiencing a severe loss of seagrass all throughout the state of Florida. Um, since 2012, Tampa Bay has lost 16% of its seagrass. Sarasota Bay has lost 18% of their seagrass in just two years. Florida Bay lost more than 60 square miles in two years. And the Indian River Lagoon, which has been in the news a lot lately, has lost 58% of its total seagrass area since 2009. Here's an example of an area that once had seagrass, but now when you go there, it's just barren. Over the last 10 years, the Indian River Lagoon has lost half of all of its seagrass, and this is an aerial photo of this. These dark patches on the left are all seagrass beds, and on the right you can see that it, now it's just sand. So what's killing Florida seagrass? Prop scarring from boats is a big problem, um, especially in the Florida Keys. This is a photo of that, and that's when people go out on their boats and they don't realize they're going over seagrass beds and they don't pull up their engine and they actually end up ripping out seagrass. Um, dredging and filling projects can also really damage seagrass. Another one is extreme weather. So climate change brings along more extreme winters and summers and storms. And storms, they increase the turbidity or the amount of sediment in the water and make it difficult for seagrasses to get enough light to photosynthesize. Freshwater runoff is also a problem because it some seagrasses have a certain tolerance of salinity that they can grow in. And when a lot of freshwater runoff comes into an area, it'll make it difficult for seagrasses to thrive. There's also aging infrastructure. Florida has a lot of people and we don't have the infrastructure or the septic systems and sewers to really support the amount of people that are in some of these areas and our water treatment plants can't pull all of the nutrients out of the water that are going into it and they're ending up back in our waterways and these nutrients are causing more problems for the grasses. We also have discharges from Lake Okeechobee. This is in, um, there's certain areas like in St. Lucie where the Okeechobee uh, directly discharges its fresh water into the system and it brings a lot of nutrients with it, way too many nutrients. And this can cause algal blooms, which is my last one, harmful algal blooms, which I'll talk a little bit more about now. So what are algal blooms? Algae is a plant-like organism that lives in the water, but it is not a plant in the typical sense. It makes food with the sun and photosynthesizes, but they don't have stems or leaves. And you can see that on the left picture here. And these are some, this is a photo of some of the cells in algae. When algae grows out of control, it's called an algal bloom. And it's usually caused from excess nutrients in the water from runoff, fertilizers and septic systems um, that allow this algae to grow out of control. Algae is always in the waterway, but when it has access to all these extra excess nutrients, it can just grow until it runs out. So why are these blooms harmful? Algal, algal blooms block light to plants in the water like seagrasses and the plants die because they can't get the light that they need. And eventually 
the algae runs out of nutrients to grow and it dies. And when it dies, the decomposition process uses all the oxygen in the water and the animals start to die as well because they don't have enough oxygen to breathe. And they can also produce toxins. Um, red tide is one that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, it produces a toxin that can cause species to have neurological problems like seizures and manatees that have red tide poisoning need to be rescued. Manatees in the Indian River Lagoon are struggling. I'm sure some of you have heard about what's been going on in the Indian River Lagoon. The Indian River Lagoon is a, and actually a grouping of three lagoons that makes up 40% of the East Coast of Florida. And as I said, it lost over half of all the seagrasses in the last decade. And what's happening right now is manatees go to the Indian River Lagoon every winter in order to stay warm because manatees can't be in water less than 68 degrees Fahrenheit for, over, for a certain amount of time or they get something equivalent to frostbite or hypothermia. They get really sick. And so they need to stay in these warm water areas. And this warm water in the Indian River Lagoon is created by power plants and thermal basins, which are areas where there's a, it's deep enough and it holds in heat so it stays warm. Algal blooms in this area have killed almost all of the seagrass, so manatees are having trouble finding food. And during the winter, manatees, when they're in these areas, like at the power plant, they can only leave the warm water for a little bit of time in order to go out and find food. And if they get too cold, they can die. So they can't spend a lot of time out looking for food and the food isn't there. So they have to end up waiting at these warm water sites until it gets warmer before they can leave. And a lot of times now that means that they're starving. And in the pictures here, you can see this manatee up at the top. You can see their ribs showing and that's showing how thin this animal is. So what's being done to help manatees right now? The Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership is made up of nonprofits, agencies, and ocean areas, so zoo and, zoos and aquariums, that are working to rescue, rehab, and release manatees. And here's a photo of a baby manatee and then manatees that are being prepped for a release. Um, another thing that's being done to help manatees is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission are working together to supplementally feed manatees in the northern Indian River Lagoon. So that means that they're providing enough food for the manatees to get through the winter, but not enough to feed them everything that's been lost because we don't want to encourage them to stay in the same areas after winter is over. And so far, it's been warming up the last couple of weeks. And at one point, there were over 800 manatees in this area, in the feeding area, and now we're down to around 70. So the water is warming up and the manatees are moving out just like we hoped they would. So what else is being done to help manatees? We at Save the Manatee Club, along with being a, a part of the Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership, are expanding our other partnerships on the East Coast to help support restoration efforts. So the restoration of seagrasses and mangroves and clams. We're continuing to help with the rescues and releases of manatees. And we're also supporting work using drones that are being used to help assess the body condition of manatees in the Indian River Lagoon. So this is the drone shot from above of manatees near the power plant. And at one point we saw over a thousand of them. And our goal is to eventually be able to use drones to tell if a manatee needs to be rescued from the air. So what's being done to save seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon? There are a lot of groups that are working together in order to improve the water quality. And one of the ways to improve water quality is to plant clams and oysters. And clams and oysters actually filter a ton of water and produce fresh water after they're done. So putting more clams in the water is a great way to improve water quality. Um, there's also organizations that are monitoring and collecting data on seagrass growth throughout Florida, like the water management districts. We also have groups like the Florida Oceanographic Society that are growing seagrasses uh, in nursery tanks and then prepping them to be planted. And here's an example of that on the bottom right. This is seagrass. They actually start as fragments so people can collect fragments of seagrass, essentially leaves that have shed. Uh, seasonally, seagrass will shed their leaves like other plants do, and you can find them floating in the water. And what they do is they collect these fragments and you can plant that you can put them directly on mats or plant them directly into the ground and they'll grow. So this is an example of matting where you put them on a mat and then plant them and it helps them hold on better to the sediment.
So we also have uh, the governor has approved $53 million in grants to improve water quality in the Indian River Lagoon. And uh, those grants are going to be used to replace septic tanks and update the wastewater treatment plants, um, which will reduce nutrients entering the lagoon overall, overall. But that's not something that can happen overnight, and it will take time, just like a lot of these restorations projects will. We have also partnered with the Marine Resources Council to bring together seagrass nursery growers, scientists, advocates, and resource managers in the next year or so. And doing so, we're hoping to assist with efforts in seagrass planting and restoration in the Indian River Lagoon. So what can you do to help? Uh, if you live in Florida or anywhere that's close to a waterway, you can use less fertilizer and not fertilize during the rainy season. If you fertilize during the rainy season, most of that fertilizer is actually going to run off right into the waterways. You can be active in your community. So you can volunteer for local restoration events in your area, like clam or seagrass plantings. You can learn if there's local groups collecting seagrass fragments. And you can volunteer for Save the Manatee Club. Um, if you're, even if you're not in an area where Florida seagrass is, we have opportunities to educate the public through webinars and virtual talks and can spread the message about why seagrass is important. You can also protect the marine environment by watching for seagrass whenever you're boating and always keeping a spotter on your boat so you can keep an eye out for manatees. You can learn your local boating rules. There are some areas where seagrass is marked and you're gonna wanna avoid those when you're boating as well as manatee protection areas where it's been determined that you need to go slower in order to protect manatees in the area. And always throw your trash away and recycle your fishing line. We recently had an incident where a manatee passed away because of in, because of uh, ingesting, ingesting fishing line. So it's very important that you recycle all of your fishing line and not leave it in the environment. If you see any sick, injured, or dead manatees, you can report it to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission alert hotline. And I would like to ask that everyone please write down this number and have it in your phone because it's a lot quicker if you already have it versus having to look it up. Uh, I have it in my phone and it's always recommended. So please do. You can also donate to Save the Manatee Club or adopt a manatee to support manatee conservation and future restoration efforts. Um, we are partnering with other groups to uh, encourage restoration, and we're going to be doing more of that moving forward. And you can also check out our savethemanatee.org slash algae page for more info. We have more information on what's happening in the Indian River Lagoon um, and more detail. We also have a manatee sighting form. This is the older version of it, but it's recently been updated. And if you see a healthy manatee, if, you, if you're in an area where you see manatees often, or even if you're just on vacation and you happen upon one, you can report it via our sighting form. Um, it's available online through our website and you can just fill it out kind of like a Google form. You can indicate the time you saw the animal, the date, exactly where you were um, in our new form. You can actually just look up your location so you don't have to search where you are, especially if you're on vacation and you're not sure where you are at the time. It's a lot easier. You can note the number of animals and the activity they're doing, but we please request that you do not report sick animals. We have a webinar on how to spot um, and uh, how to spot and um, report sick and injured manatees. So if you're interested in that, it's been recorded and you can watch that on our website as well. And that's the end of my presentation. Do we have any questions? So I've been monitoring the, um, well, first of all, great presentation. Thank you, Tiari, and also thank you for everyone who came in. Um, just a, a, a quick note for those who came in a little bit late. I know we had some uh, some latecomers. This presentation is being recorded and we will post this on our website, on our social media, and we will also send a link out to everybody who registered. So if you miss part of the presentation or you want to look something up, that will be posted. I know that was one of the questions that was asked. Um, all right, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, maybe I'll just read them out and then Tiare can um, can address them. So Rhonda's first question, do you believe the supplemental feeding was meaningful? 160,000 pounds is only five to 10 acres of production. Do, uh, to feed 800 manatees and prevent starvation, we would have needed 100 times that. So thank you for the question. I absolutely do think it was meaningful. I think that it has 
kept some animals that would have needed to be rescued from being rescued. And one of the biggest problems we were having during, it's called an unusual manatee mortality event, essentially when there are a lot of animals dying within a certain period of time. And one of the biggest issues that we had at the state level is not having the capacity to rescue all of these animals because there was nowhere to put them. And being able to keep manatees in the water and give them food and prevent them from having to be rescued from starvation is very important. Um, and there are manatees that are still there, even though it's warming up. And we believe that's because these are animals that really need the food. They're really hungry and they don't have the energy potentially to leave the area. Um, there is no question that without this supplemental feeding, more manatees would have died and needed to be rescued. But we do feel that it could have been started sooner, but you know, it takes a long time to get these things approved, especially since it is illegal to feed and water manatees um, under federal law. Great, okay, um, just a reminder for everybody, if you can please put your questions in the Q&A function, because that's what I'm going through right now. I'm also going to go back to the ones that were posted in the chat, but if you could please put them in the Q&A function, that's easier for me to keep track of and hopefully address them in the order that they came in. I've already messed it up, um, but I try to do my best here. If you can just put them in there, that way I can make sure we don't miss any of them. The Q&A um, section, I saw a question about where it is. Um, on my computer, the chat bubble is on the top, and then to the right of that, the Q&A is up there as well. And if for some reason you can't find it, you can put the questions in the chat. I'll take a look at those as well. Um, if you are raising your hand, I think some people have raised their hands. If you can just please type your questions, that way we'll make sure we address them because we have everyone muted, so I cannot hear you, but you can type those questions out. All right, so the second question I had um, in, this, uh, in the Q&A here is, can you compare the impact of herbicides with nutrient, algae, and shading on the reduction of photosynthesis in Florida. So I guess so, how herbicides and nutrients uh, play into that. So there is research is still ongoing as to the effects of herbicides. It is suspected because they don't discriminate when it comes to what they're targeting for, that it is causing a problem, but we don't have any standardized data that says how big of a problem it is. But if seagrasses are already being threatened by so many other factors and you add something like herbicides on top of it, it's obviously going to make the problem worse. And there are a lot of people who are going out there now and they're looking for specific herbicides in waterways and in tissues and in plants, but I specifically am not doing that. But I think in the next few years, we might be starting to get some answers. But it's one of those things where because we've had this huge die off, now it's getting more attention than it ever has. So we're still learning. Good answer. So next question was, how long before winter of 2020-21 have we been seeing manatee starvation in the Indian River Lagoon? So winter, it, it, so we call it manatee season essentially, and it's from around November to the beginning of April. And it really depends on the temperature. Sometimes it's not as cold and sometimes it's colder. And we've been seeing a lot of shifts in what is considered typical weather with climate change in the last couple of years. Like sometimes the cold snaps have been worse and sometimes they haven't. So it's really hard to say, but we know that coming into around the October, November time period when the air starts to get colder, that more and more manatees will be moving to warm water sites around the state, not just in the Indian River Lagoon. But a lot of these areas have cameras set up and daily observers looking for manatees. So once they're there, we will know they're there. It won't be a delay. Um, and that's something to keep in mind for this year is, will they be doing the feeding trial again? Um, I can't speak to that because I don't work for the FWC. But of course, we would like to encourage that if it's, is, if it's going to save manatee lives while we're waiting for the lagoon to recover, then we encourage it. And just to add a little bit to that, in case you were wondering about timeframes in terms of like, have we seen anything like this before, say in, you know, 2010 or 2015 or something, if you're talking yearly, um, the first time we really saw the starvation event was really in the winter of 2020, 2021. But how, what Tiara explained was that we started seeing these really severe algae blooms after 2010. So 2013, 2015, we had very bad algae blooms. Now, what we need to keep in mind with these blue-green algae blooms or brown algae blooms is that oftentimes 
the really severe effects are not visible until years after the fact. If you're looking at a red tide, you're immediately seeing dead fish, dead dolphins, dead pelicans, dead manatees. It's an immediate thing. You know, it's in the media, it's in the public's eye. Um, with these other algae blooms in Indian River Lagoon, it really took years for those effects to really show. And that was the problem because it was almost when the wake up call came, it was too late. You know, we already saw hundreds of manatees and now the system is just so severely degraded that it's going to potentially take decades to fix it. So, um, you know, we didn't see any any major starvation before 2020, but the problem was was coming. And then, um, like Tiara said, um, we definitely want the public to look out for any sick, injured manatees, any manatees that look emaciated and to report them, because although the winter is over right now and manatees are migrating away, you may actually now start to see these emaciated animals in other parts of the state, in southern Florida, um, in northern Florida, even in Georgia or maybe the Carolinas, if they make it that far. So it's really important right now to look out for any um, any emaciated or any sick animals, because just because they're leaving that warm water side, doesn't mean the problem is fixed and they're all you know strong and healthy and are doing great. And again, also really important to both slowly and really watch out for them because they're probably in a much weaker state coming out of this winter right now than they would be in a normal winter. So they're even more prone to, you know, ingesting debris or getting hit by boats. So really important to watch out for these guys. But and it's well, it's sorry. it's not uncommon for manatees to thin during the winter because they are stuck in these areas where you know especially in the last couple of years even spring areas that would typically have freshwater grasses have lost a lot of that as well so manatees are used to leaving a cold a warm water area to find food and coming back but that takes a lot of energy so that is a common thing that manatees do it's just that manatees are coming to these areas in the indian river lagoon and they're finding nothing you know and that's really the problem and also the winters are long, so a lot of these manatees have been without regular access to food for a long time before they're rescued. And what's happening is that when they are rescued, it's taking them a lot longer than typical to get nursed back to health before they're released. Um, a lot of these animals are also getting tagged because we want to make sure that the next winter comes around, that they're still doing all right and that they're not going to need to be rescued again. So we're keeping an eye on them as well. Awesome. All right. I'm going to um, this is the last question, the Q&A, and I'm going to head over to the chat. So um, how can someone from out of state help? So one way you can help is to donate. Um, all of the donations that we get are go, go directly to the conservation of manatees. There are also other organizations that are doing great work that we're partnering with, um, and you can help support them by getting the word out. Um, we're going to have more about that on our website, but Brevard Zoo, um, the Marine Resources Council, groups on the East Coast that are actively doing restoration, um, you know, they're always looking for people to be interested in what they're doing as well. Um, you can help by volunteering. You don't have to be in Florida to be a volunteer and to help give presentations. There's a lot of schools and libraries and groups that want to know about manatees, but they're not in Florida and they don't even realize that they can get something like that. So if you're really interested in talking with people and, and educating more people, you can absolutely do that as well. Um, and if you do come to Florida on vacation, you know, keeping an eye out for manatees is also important. I know it's been spring break recently, so that's something to keep an eye on that a lot of people are out on the water that some people have never even seen a manatee before. Um, and that's another thing too, is if you do come here on vacation to try to become a little educated on the area you're going to be boating in if you rent a boat, um, if you rent a kayak to use passive observation, which is essentially not getting too close to the animals because we don't want to disturb their behavior, especially if they're feeding these animals. It takes a lot of energy for them to go out and find food. And when we disturb what they're doing, it can, you know, it can, it can cause harmful effects for them as well. And yes, you can sign up for our newsletter and our action alerts online. And all of this information will be provided in the follow up email to the presentation. Yeah, and our action alerts oftentimes have um, um, then they're not just Florida specific, but they also ask for people from out of state to you know sign certain petitions or submit a letter to to the governor or even a letter to the president, which we have right now. If you go to our action alert page, there's quite a few things that you can do and you don't have to be in Florida for that. All right, I'm heading over to the chat function right now, so hopefully I'll get everybody addressed. And we have one question from Taylor. Um, I am in Colorado, but I'm visiting in Tampa in early May. Where can I see manatees? 
Well, it's interesting in some areas of Florida, it's easier to see manatees during warmer weather than it is during colder weather. Um, in Tampa, manatees are all throughout the bay. Um, so I can't say specifically where you could see them, but I'm sure that there are places online that you could see um, where they've most recently saw manatees. Um, but I can't tell you for certain. I do uh, During the winter, we know for sure where manatees are because they typically go to the same places every winter, like the same warm water sites. But in the summer, they can, a lot of animals go out of state. They'll even go over to Texas or they'll go all the way up, sometimes even to Massachusetts. So it can be hard to say once it's warmer. Yeah, I put a um, link in the chat um, to our website, save the manager.org slash viewing. Um, we have a list of places where you can see them. Like Tiare said, the best time to really see them is between November and beginning or middle of March, because that's when they come to these warm water sites. So that's when they really congregate in these large aggregations. And it's pretty predictable that they're going to be there. Now they're dispersing, so it's a little harder to pinpoint um, sort of where to see them. All right, we have a question from Ellen. Um, are there any grassroots or community groups doing mailings or contacting government agencies who have the ability to control large companies who use too much or inappropriate fertilizer? I don't necessarily think they have the ability to control what other companies are doing. The biggest thing that, that we can do with advocacy is to get as many people interested, members of the public, interested as possible um, and have them support, you know, these pro-environmental movements. Um, I think Defenders for Wildlife is, is one that does a lot of advocacy and reaching out, um, and we also do as well. Um, but as far as actively controlling what other companies do, that is very difficult. Um, so it really takes people stepping up and a public outcry and saying, we're not going to stand for this. That really makes the difference. And that's why we have on our website, the ability for people to, to sign, write a little thing and sign a letter and send it to the governor or our representative, because getting the word out is very important. So we also have our um, senior conservation associate, Kim Dinkins, on the phone um, with us, and she may be able to uh, if she wants to add a little bit to this question. That was a really great answer, Tiara, but I'm just, I wanna give Kim the chance if she wants to um, to Absolutely. add to that. Yeah, hi, um, I, I'm sorry I'm late. I wanted to just um, pipe in and say that Florida does have regulations for fertilizer applicators um, in, in our regulations, I mean, in our legislation. Um, so there are rules that govern them what ends up happening, and there are actually classes and um, continuing education credits that they have to take. Um, what ends up happening oftentimes, though, I think is that an enforcement side, um, you know, homeowners in Florida want to have green grass. So there's a little bit of pushback um, from sometimes from their clients. And so they put them in a little bit of a difficult situation. But like Tiari said, Save the Manatee Club is advocating for str more stringent um, local ordinances on fertilizers and um, trying to get education out about what individuals can do um, to better protect our waterways. Awesome, thanks, Kim. Um, I have another question here from Eileen. Um, asking how many years will it take? I assume this is um, in regards to how many years it will take to restore the um, the seagrass or the, the health of the Indian River Lagoon, I assume. Well, there's no way to know for sure, and it really depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how much funding some of these restoration groups can get and how much restoration can be done. It depends on how fast we can get these wastewater treatment plants and septic systems updated in order to reduce the amount of nutrients entering the lagoon. Um, but it's definitely not going to be a quick process and it's not going to be fixed in the next year or two. It would have to be a miracle for things to turn around that quickly and things typically don't. Um, and it's one of those things where a lot of people were aware that there was declining water quality in the lagoon for years, but without a without something to show it was happening it's really hard to visualize you know that all this grass is being lost and that there's problems with water quality and manatees really get they pull on the heartstrings and people are saying hey this isn't right we need to do something but unfortunately you know if we had done something a couple of years ago we wouldn't be in the position we're in now so it is going to take a while for things to come back but on the positive side the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program has funded 
over 50 projects and they're going towards um, restoration and updating infrastructure and things like that. And those projects are doing well. And the Indian River um, Lagoon report card from the Marine Resources Council actually showed that some areas are improving in water quality, but they've been releasing that report card for years. So things are moving, but it's slow. So having more and more people be interested in, in these things and pushing for them to get done definitely does make a difference. Because we've already, think about how many times this, what's been going on in the Indian River Lagoon has been on the news just in the last year. And that's because people are angry. You know, and that makes a difference. Yeah, I have a question here from Lee. I think this has probably been um, sort of answered by now, but I'm going to address it anyway. Um, my question, how will seagrass restoration be feasible in the Indian River Lagoon since A, it has a low success rate normally, and B, the area is polluted? How are these manatees going to be helped absent future feeding trials? So there are areas of the lagoon that are doing better than other areas. And there have been restoration projects. They're actively ongoing and they're doing well. It's just that the Indian River Lagoon is just for reference, 156 miles long. And it's a lot of seagrass that's been lost. But the good thing about seagrass, as I mentioned earlier, is it spreads on its own. If it's able to grow and really set down its roots, it spreads on its own. Um, so once you start planting, if things stay positive you're going to have continued growth um, and we're having this the seagrass assembly one of the purposes of that is to potentially identify more areas where we know seagrass planting will be successful and there has been success with planting it one of the main things they're doing here is like i said taking these fragments which are easy to get and free because they're already floating in the water and just planting them in in the bottom in these tanks and so it's not like a wasted effort or costing you know like an obscene amount of money just to get the plants to grow but we do need to improve capacity there aren't a lot of groups that are doing that that are growing their own seagrass and that's something that we're looking to help with as well is how can we make this better and and that's one of the things would be to just increase the amount of people that are able to do it and the knowledge have the knowledge out there so more people could do it if they want to great now we have a comment also from lee and i can probably talk a little bit about that to give tiara just a, a quick minute of a break um her comment was now that manti feeding is in the news people all over are taking it upon themselves um, to feed them and give them fresh water. So yes, this is a problem. And I think Tiara made it clear in her presentation that this was a very small scale, limited feeding trial that was done in the Indian River Lagoon to get some of those panties through the winter. And this was conducted by um, state and federal agencies. Now it remains illegal to feed or give water to manatees. And the main reason behind that is because any wildlife that gets fed, including manatees, become very habituated to humans. So they may linger in an area that they really should be migrating out of. And they may get habituated to approach people, docks and boats. And if they lose their natural fear of boats, for example, it can really put them in harm's way. We have a lot of manatees that come right up to the boat. Um, you know, they hear uh, water dripping down and they um, they associate that with a handout. And then people don't look, they turn on their motor, they turn on the propeller and yeah, we have the injury. So um, it's it's really not good practice to feed them or give them water. You think you're making a difference in the in the short term, but it, it, it it's really not. And if you get caught, it is a pretty hefty fine. So we just definitely discourage people from doing that. We know people's hearts are in the right place, but that's why there are other opportunities to volunteer your time or your money to um to help manatees that way. And I do so want to say too. Yeah. that in in for some animals you know if they've been if they've been without food for a very long time it is not good for them to just start eating more food right away it's 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 very well known you know in um rehab that when an animal hasn't had food for a long time the digestive system slows down and doesn't work the way it normally does and so just providing food to these animals that probably if, if you're at a point where an animal is thin enough you're like man i should be feeding this animal they probably need to be rescued um, or at least have an eye kept on them by an fwc biologist but if you just feed them and they go on their way well now we'll never know where did they go how are they doing that information is lost because we don't have it so it's important to let the authorities know if you see an animal that looks like it's in distress yes absolutely 
Um, so I have two questions that might be um, pretty well suited for Kim because she is very um, up to date on, on our lawsuit as well as water quality issues. So um, I'm going to see if maybe she would be able to, to answer them. The first one we have here from Rhonda um, talks, asking, can you talk about your lawsuit, the statutes, plaintiffs, who in Florida is actually responsible for enforcing, for enforcing water quality? Okay. Um, yeah, so in Florida, the Department of Environmental Protection is um, mandated with protecting water quality, um, but those, um, they, they have a total maximum daily load program that establishes amount of nutrients that can go into a water body, um, and then they develop basin management action plans. But the, so the actual actions that have to be taken to protect the water quality typically fall to local governments. Um, and so that process is, takes a long time and it also costs a lot of money. So um, that's where some of that, that rub has been is in the enforcement of those total maximum daily loads and the basin management action plans. Um, as far as our lawsuits go at the federal level, um, and I'll back up a little bit and say that even though the Department of Environmental Protection is in charge of water quality, ultimately it's the um, Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level that delegates that responsibility to the state. So, um, I was um, really interested to learn when I first came on board that the, there is a nexus between the Clean Water Act, um, which EPA administers, and the um, Endangered Species Act, which the Fish and Wildlife Service administers for um, manatees. And our lawsuit basically is, um, it is asking the Fish and Wildlife Service to establish critical habitat and define it as uh, the biological uh, with the biological indicators that support manatees. Right now, it's just basically a geographic area. So our thought is that if that happens, then we can um, further protect water quality to ensure that manatees are protected into the long term. So that's, that's I hope that answers the question about the lawsuit. Now we have one uh, more question that might be uh, well suited for Kim. Um, there is pending legislation to have seagrass mitigation. How do you expect that to impact limited seagrass beds? Yeah, um, that legislation was um, not passed in Florida. We were not supportive of that. What it really was, um, I think it was one of those other well-intended um, but not well thought out uh, programs. It was really intended to allow degradation of um, seagrass beds in certain areas and then mitigate on public lands. Um, and so our thought is, a, it sounds like the folks in the room know that um, seagrass mitigation isn't entirely successful, and so you're taking a, you know, a known seagrass meadow and losing it for the possibility that it might happen somewhere else. Um, so we were not supportive of that, and thankfully uh, it didn't pass in this legislative session, and we're looking forward to working with those uh, sponsors on better legislation moving forward. Perfect. OK, great. Um, we just have a couple more questions. Well, somebody's pointing out um, if you have an Amazon account, you can choose Save the Manatee Club as your Amazon Smile charity of choice. Yes, you can do that. You go to smileamazon.com. We are registered with them and um, that is definitely a, a good way to help. Um, we also we, so we have two more questions here. One, um, will SMC advocate for more nutritious food like hyacinth, hydrilla or water lettuce? And I assume that's in uh, in regard to the to the uh, to the feeding trial in the uh, Indian River Lagoon. So that is a there's a big misconception out there right now that the lettuce that is being provided to the manatees at for this supplemental feeding is not nutritious and that is not true. While it is possible to provide these invasive species for manatees and they do eat them. The good thing about providing lettuce is one and I I've spoken to someone with FWC, they talked with vets at the other aquariums and zoos about what to feed them. And lettuce is actually the easiest to digest for manatees that are sick. It has a ton of nutrients and it's very easy to digest. And these animals that are being rescued are very sick. And the ones too that are feeding at the power plant, a lot of them, you know, need these nutrients quickly. Um, it's also easy to control everything about the production of the lettuce. You know where it comes from, who's making it, you know, all of those things from A to B, it's controllable and it reduces a lot of things that could go wrong by providing it. And it's also, we know that there is an unlimited amount 
that is able to be provided versus having to physically go out and collect all of these species from the water. And then do you have to, you know, do you have to separately clean them? Like, what is the whole process? It's very, that's very difficult versus something that we already make for humans. It's human grade and providing it to manatees. And they're even given that in captivity and it is healthy for them. So it is a big misconception that they're not being provided the food that is nutritious. They are. Um, so we don't have a problem with them being provided lettuce. All right, we have one last question here in the Q&A. Um, again, if anyone else has any questions, you can put them either in the chat or the q and I'm keeping a, um, an eye on both. And for those who signed in um, a little late, we are going to, uh, we recorded this presentation or we will be posting that on our website and our social media. And those who, um, you know, if you registered via email, you will also get an email with a link. So I have one question here from Allison. Do you think um, we save the manatees? One second, I gotta read this. Do you think we save the manatees and prevent the extinction? So I think this means, um, do you think that we can prevent the extinction of the manatee? Like we? I, <laughs> yes, I do. I, well, I think that the the only way we can prevent it is as people to do everything we can. But you know, save the manatee club has been advocating for better manatee protections for decades and pushing for, you know, these manatee protection zones and things. And I think um, when before, when manatees were first listed as endangered, there were only, it was estimated there were around a thousand of them. And now there were around 8,000. Um, and while that, at least we were in 2015 when the estimate was done. And while that seems like it might be a lot of animals, one, we typically lose at least 500 every year to boating, cold stress, red tide, entanglement, harassment. Um, and the last year we lost over a thousand. So right now we're not sure how many there are, but we do know that if we don't continue to advocate for protections, you know, they'll the amount of people in Florida and the number of boats will just continue to increase and the threats against manatees will not decrease. And that's where we are now, where manatees were downlisted from endangered to threatened because their population increased, but we know that none of the threats they face have decreased. And this is just an example of poor, of water quality being poor and development causing this huge issue in the Indian River Lagoon. So if we don't continue to advocate and push for better protections and, you know, sue to improve water quality, then who knows what could happen. But we know that we need to be here and stand up for manatees because they can't stand up for themselves. That was a great answer. So if anyone has any uh, last minute questions, please type them in the chat or the, um, the Q&A function. And um, let's see. Anybody? I just saw that someone said they saw a manatee today, and that would be great if you could fill out our online form and submit any pictures or any information that you have, because we collect data from all over the state about where we're seeing these animals, and it's actually used to help um, advocate for better protections if we, you know, if the FWC says we need data to prove manatees are here in order for us to make a change, we have it you know, but only because people submit their sightings data to us. So if you please go ahead and submit that, definitely would be appreciated. Thank you so much. Great, I have, um, there was two questions that just came in um, um, on the last minute. Um, one is from Jennifer, um, maybe that would be for Kim, but I'll, I'll just read it out and you can, you can decide. Um, I heard you talking about the issues caused by nutrient overload and that it's caused by having too many people in Florida in the septic tanks and lawn fertilizers. However, another obvious source of nutrients in the waterways is from agriculture. What is being done to reduce the excessive amounts fertilizer of fertilizer that ends up in the water from agriculture? Yes, that would definitely be a Kim question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, in Florida, we uh, the Department of Ag and Consumer Services uh, administers a Best management, best management practices program and any commercial producer that's in an impaired water body watershed is supposed to um, enroll. The issue with that program, which sounds great on paper and really has had a lot of uh, money and uh, expertise applied toward it, is that it's not implemented well. So in the Indian River Lagoon, for example, only about 6% of agricultural producers are enrolled in the BMP program. Um, which is one of the major issues that Save the Manatee Club has with Florida's um, water quality um, implementation. 
so that was a good question. Yeah, agriculture, uh, you know, they, they've come a long way, like everybody has, but there's still a long way to go. And that's really our, our biggest push is making, holding folks accountable for being, implementing what can be implemented. And that's one of the, so another thing that we've done is um, the basin management action plans that are used to determine, you know, how much nutrients can be put into a system. Um, a few of them were being passed and we didn't agree that it was being done the right way and we challenged those. And um, so that's another thing that we're doing is if we see, you know, these laws that potentially could harm our waterways or plans being pushed that we think don't have the best science backing them, we will push against that and say, hey, you know, this needs to be reviewed or that shouldn't pass. And um, having people behind us who agree is very important. Yes. Um, okay, five minutes left in our scheduled meeting. Okay, I have two more questions that I'm going to do. The first one is pretty simple. How many uh, mantis were rescued this winter? And I actually just pulled up the statistics uh, while Tiara and Kim were talking. Um, so 41 mantis have been rescued so far. That's from the beginning of the year until March 18th. Um, that's overall, that's throughout the entire state. That is a pretty high number already. Um, last year, I believe, um, throughout the entire year, there were over 150 mantis that were rescued. Again, a very, very high number. And I'm um, also keeping in mind a lot of them are orphan calves, which, um, you know, take a lot of time to rehabilitate once they are being brought into a rehabilitation facility. So um, if you want any more information on those statistics, they're available online. FWC publishes them every week, so you can look at the both the rescue and the mortality statistics. Um, where's the place to document seeing manatees? That was the um, citing form that Tiara put in her presentation. I'm going to type that into the oh, chat. I got it. Oh, she got I it? Just I just copied it. I got will it. Okay. put it in the chat. org slash sightings. Um, and then we have one last question here from Jennifer. Um, another question I have is about herbicides that are sprayed by FWC. Don't they also contribute to the problem with the seagrass die-off? So, as I was saying earlier, we aren't for sure. Um, we don't know for sure that herbicides are directly affecting seagrasses, but it is suspected. Um, one of the biggest things right now with the spraying is we're actually asking a lot of these agencies not to spray because it impacts these invasive species. And while, you know, it's good to make sure the waterways are navigable. Manatees eat these species, and in areas where seagrass is being lost, it's important to leave any vegetation that manatees will eat because they'll eat it for free. You know, versus spending all this money to spray it or mechanically get rid of it, manatees will eat it. So we're, in general, not advocating for spraying, um, and we've been having meetings and talking more about that. Um, so that's something we're going to be pushing more for this year as well. And also keeping in mind, there are certain areas already that are protected. For example, Blue Spring State Park, there is a moratorium area that is in effect between October and March. Now that's in the St. John's River, it's not connected to the seagrasses, but that's actually an area where no spraying or any sort of vegetation removal is allowed to happen in that time frame. And we're having regular meetings with different agencies to go over that moratorium, see if it needs to be extended, if additional areas need to be added. So it's really important to, to realize there are certain areas in place where no spraying or no vegetation removal is allowed during winter time. So there is sufficient food sources available for manatees. Um, all right, when is the next manatee forum? Um, I am not sure. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say as well. Can't tell you at this moment in time. Um, but um, if you're aware of the Manatee Forum, then I would reach out to whoever you usually reach out to for that. Um, it will probably be posted online. I don't know the date. I know, I think it's once a year or maybe it's biannually. I'm not, I'm not really, maybe it's twice a year. I'm, I'm really not entirely sure. I know there is there is one, but unless Kim has any information on that, I'm honestly, I'm not sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, it happens twice a year. Yeah, I just don't know what the next date is. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, because we're at the end of our presentation here, please feel free to reach out to us through our form online. You can click contact us and send your questions through there. Um, a lot of great questions in here. Thank you so much for all the participation, and I hope that you enjoyed our webinar. It will be posted um, hopefully within a week or so, and there'll be an email along with it with some of the resources we discussed today. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in and everyone have a good night. Yes, thank you all so much. Bye. Bye everyone.